Howdy, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of Rednecks Rising, your favorite anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-fascist Appalachian podcast. This is our first one-on-one solo hosted episode in at least a couple of weeks, although I did guest host an episode on Dixieland and the Proletariat a week or two ago where I took us through a deep dive into Mother Jones's history and legacy and went into that whole shebang in much more detail than I had previously gone into in our very own race and labor rabbit hole mini series. So if you haven't checked that out yet, make sure to go give it a listen. I also did dual post it to our own podcast platform. So you can find that labeled episode number... 14. It is so good to be back with y'all again. And I'm also not going to lie. The combination of being a mom, a partner, a working full time person, and trying to like exist as a human under the traumatic events of late stage capitalism are really catching up to me. (laughs) And the last couple of weeks in particular have just been really depleting for me all the way around. And I have been finding myself totally out of mental and emotional bandwidth as I've been trying to prepare for this episode. And I think that's just something that I want to be honest with y'all about because it's, I think it's perfectly normal and healthy as a part of you can't see me gesturing vaguely, just coping with this life. And also because it's not fair for you to feel like you weren't getting the content that you signed up for. And I want you to at least have as much context as possible in regards to the ebbs and flows of my own energy and capacity that I'm able to put towards this project, this passion project, if you will, in a super dedicated and intentional manner. And I'm also a Capricorn. So I know a Capricorn sun and most of my chart (laughs) lies in Capricorn. So I know that I hold myself to a super high standard and I just appreciate y'all and all the support that you have given the podcast and all of the guests that we've had in Appalachia in general. So far, we are here It is the very last episode of September, and that means that this podcast has officially been alive for more than three months at this point, and that is way farther than I had ever in my mind imagined something like this going, and I am not a content creator by nature. I never wanted to do this whole podcast thing by myself, so just to make it this far is a huge accomplishment. And in the last three months, we've been able to contribute more than $100 to the Pulaski County Free Store out of Southwest Virginia. We've amplified the voices of transgender Appalachian, traditional bluegrass musician, Clover Lynn, mutual aid organizers, Hazel and Cody, indigenous lawyer to be Sierra, Sierra Kennedy, other Appalachian podcasters, TJ with Appalachian Firesides and Gina and Raf with Fire on the Mountain. And we've had Amazon union organizer, Matt and anti-pipeline activist, Grace here on the show. We've battled to the death with the Deep South represented by Nelson from Dixieland of the Proletariat. And in our solo episodes, we've traveled from the colonial era to the modern day. And Lord have mercy, y'all, in just three months, the profound impact that this show has already made on my life and the impact that's been shared with me by the folks who listen to and follow and support the show. And the concept is just mind blowing. And I, I just can't thank y'all enough. And I can't wait to see where this journey takes us through all the ebbs and flows whether I'm able to show up with hours of research in advance or not. And I am so grateful for, and I appreciate so much all the grace and patience and support that y'all have shared so far. And that I have no doubt is going to continue to show up as we get to know each other better and connect with each other more on this ongoing journey. In all of that mushy gushy stuff said, y'all, we do have some catching up to do on our chores. But At least the podcast chores are fun because you know that there's a whole lot of good news involved. So first things first, 
Welcome to Rednecks Rising Podcast. If you're new here, I'm your host, Chelsea. I'm raised and currently rooted in the Great Smoky Mountains of Western North Carolina, where I have always lived and never left. This podcast is a community project where we come together to reveal the true radical history of Appalachian rednecks that has been erased and hidden from us, and also to chat with revolutionary rednecks who are doing awesome work up and down the hollers today. I'm coming into the podcast with a decade of experience organizing my very own community here in my home area and building power for poor and rural folks like myself. If you're hearing this and thinking that you might be in the wrong place or this podcast isn't for you, you are welcome to go and skip ahead on whatever platform you're listening to and forget you ever heard this. But I would encourage you to consider sticking around and maybe giving it a listen and seeing if you like what you hear or if it brings up some curiosity for you. I've gotten some pretty awesome feedback so far from folks on a lot of different places across the political spectrum. But That said, this podcast is also an independently produced podcast made possible by yours truly, the sole provider for a single income family who makes this content content out of a labor of love and also a passion for all things Appalachia and truth. And considering that this podcast is brought to you today by the adrenal glands that have been totally burnt out by the amount of caffeine that I take in the nicotine cravings that I still get every now and again, despite having quit smoking cigarettes in 2017, and by the coping skills that my therapists have so diligently worked to teach me over the years. And if you want to be a part of bringing this podcast to life, you can join in the fun by heading over to our Ko-Fi page, which is the alternative that we use to Patreon. Over there, you can become a monthly contributor to the show to help keep the podcast alive by covering the cost of our publishing platform that we use to send this to all of the the platforms that you listen to podcasts on to pay for the cost of books and research materials and recording equipment and so on. And all of the stuff that doesn't go towards that, half of all of the profits that come in from your contributions are put towards a group, individual, or organization on the ground doing the good work. Our first contributions from the show that we brought in from June and July were those contributions to the Pulaski County Free Store. And I'll be letting you know in the next couple of episodes where we are sending the profits and how much from August and September. But we're going to wait until September completely wraps up for me to wrap my brain around all of that math because I really just I just can't do it right now, y'all. Sorry. In addition to becoming a monthly contributor, our Ko-Fi page is also where you can go if you want to throw like a one-time donation or a tip in our direction if you enjoy the content. It's also where you can go to buy merch. And speaking of merch, we did just do our very first giveaway this month where we were giving away one of our very new dad hats. Um, And it features the slogan, Appalachian and anti-fascist on a black dad hat and the giveaway was open for a couple of weeks and I drew for a winner out of the giveaway entries on an Instagram live video on Monday of this week September 26th and the winner of our drawing was Wildlife Laney on Instagram who has already gotten in touch with me to make sure that we have the details to get their hat into their hands and it turns out that they're pretty close to me. So I think I am going to be meeting up with them later this week um, after this recording is published to deliver that hat to them and maybe take a couple of sweet pics because like the whole point of this podcast is to build community and bust myths and I'm so excited for Lainey to be a part of our community and I'm for everyone who participated in the giveaway by subscribing and reviewing the podcast tagging your friends on Instagram following us on Ko-Fi I appreciate and we appreciate y'all so so so, so, so very much. And this has been a huge way to support the show and getting our name out there and spreading awareness. And I just hope you know how much you are a part of this show. And I wish that I was wealthy enough to give away hats to everybody who entered the giveaway, but I truly just do not have that kind of money. And my debt collectors would probably be pretty pissed if I spent the money in that I do have in that way, which is not much. Um, but that's it. So congratulations, Lainey, on winning our very first giveaway prize. And if the rest of y'all want a hat of your own, you can head over to Ko-Fi where they are available for purchase in three different phrases. 
uh, Appalachian and anti-fascist, Appalachian and anti-racist, and Appalachian and anti-capitalist. Um, and multiple different color combinations of each. So you can go check those out. And then also on Ko-Fi, you'll find in our shop that we still have some spots available in our very first community organizing learning academy pilot. This is a pay what you can experience that is starts at zero dollars. And the point of the experience is to make skills and frameworks of community organizing accessible to more of the supporters and followers who are requesting that kind of uh, information and content and knowledge and so that we can start to organize in our communities across the country, across rural America, across Appalachia, wherever we might be, because Lord knows that I cannot organize everything by myself and it truly does take a village. So this uh, learning experience is going to take place completely virtually and there's going to be live workshops available, but you can also participate in the learning asynchronously if you have like a wonky or demanding schedule. So please head over to Ko-Fi for way more information on that and to join in on the learning opportunity, which will officially launch with the first live workshop on Thursday, October 6th. <clears throat> All right. Um, and that said, I also want to give a major shout out to our two latest supporters who are new to join the Rednecks Rising crew, Elijah and Amy. Thank you both so, so much. Elijah, I hope you love your new hat. And Amy, your contribution helps keep the podcast going strong. So the two of you are superstars in my book, as far as I'm concerned. And I do think that that is the last of my announcements that I have for today, other than I have previously mentioned that it's really important to me on a ethical level to use this platform, no matter how small or large it might be, to amplify the voices of Appalachians who hold identities that are that aren't historically valued or represented. So I definitely want to prioritize the voices of Black Appalachians, Indigenous Appalachians, Latinx Appalachians, and other Appalachians of color. And if you or someone you know would like to come on the pod and chat about yourself and your story and your work, would love to have you. Please feel free to reach out to me via email. It's rednecksrising at gmail.com, which is spelled just like the name of the podcast. There are no spaces, no special characters. Um, would love to hear from you and would love to feature your voice. I'm really excited about some of the interviews that I have coming up on the show. So y'all stay tuned for those. And for those of you who want to support the show, you can also do so beyond like the monetary capitalist stuff by following us, sharing us and chatting with us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. And all of those links are available through our link tree, which I will make sure to drop in the show notes along with any articles or resources slash citations related to today's episode, which I always try to do. (sighs) And with that, (laughs) a lot of chores for today, but mostly really exciting chores, good news. And I think that with that, we are ready to jump into this week's episode. Let's get started, y'all. Today, I thought we might talk about one of my favorite books, which is Elizabeth Katz's book, What You're Getting Wrong About Appalachia. A lot of folks ask me what books they should read to learn more about Appalachia from an authentic perspective that factors in the considerations around race, class, heritage, and history across the region. And this is one that I highly recommend if you're listening and you haven't read it yet and you are a book reader, check it out. It's available on audiobook. I I think it's available on audiobook. Um, My copy was gifted to me by one of my mentors and professors while I was in my final semester of my graduate program. And I had never even read Hillbilly Elegy at that point, but she told me that (laughs) she basically was like, you do not need to read it um, unless you just feel so inspired and asked if I would be okay with Uh, her giving me a copy of Elizabeth's book instead, which of course I am never going to turn down a free book, especially not from someone who I admire really strongly. 
And one of the reasons that I really like this book in particular is because the author also provides many other pieces of literature and resources to turn to for folks who are like, hey, do you have a list of books that I should check out for Appalachia? Um, And I think that makes it a really great starting place because you can start with Elizabeth's book and then go on to explore the topics that she touches on by looking into the other resources that she provides. And you can do that even by like honing in on what interests you out of the like vast array of information that she shares related to Appalachia. So let's jump in with like my synopsis and reflections, shall we? So Elizabeth starts her book, uh, What You're Getting Wrong About Appalachia, by setting the stage with how Appalachia and Appalachians, like so many other groups of people and their homes, are defined via a top-down process in which defining our people and our culture and our sense of place is often this process where people in power or people with capital tell us who or what we are, the rich and powerful, right? Even to this day, as it is like Appalachia is being defined by folks like J.D. Vance, Trump, Jennifer Lawrence, news pundits, other folks who all are just telling us who we are and who we are not. And this speaks to so much of the reasoning that I had in my head and my heart when I started this podcast in what was really an attempt to reclaim the word redneck and reclaim the idea of being an Appalachian, which has intentionally been taken by those in power in order to scapegoat us and define us in a way that suits their interests, even when their definitions of us so clearly are in contradiction with the truth of our story and our history. And Elizabeth shares a quote uh, very close to the beginning of her book where uh, from Bell Hooks. And I'm also going to share that quote here. And Bell says, with critical awareness, we must recognize the spaces of openness and solidarity forged in the concrete experience of living in communities that were always present in radical spaces in Appalachia, both then and now. And Bell goes on to say, I believe it is essential for unity and diversity to gather those seeds of progressive change and struggle that have long characterized the lives of some individuals. And it's funny because I was actually reading a different book that was just all about the concepts of the intersection of race, class, heritage, and history. And that other book actually asked the question, who gets to be remembered? And whose story gets to be told? And what parts of their story get to be told? And who gets to define our history? And this other book that I was reading really was giving depth to what Kat, Elizabeth Cat started her book off by sharing and explaining that there is a struggle to recognize the memory of working class uprisings, like the ones that are deeply embedded in our history in Appalachia, because capital and labor are at odds in regards to how they should preserve that history. The history of working class folks like us in Appalachia is really often being defined through the context of trying to forget it or to blur or obscure its political and cultural significance, which is so very aligned with what we've covered already in this podcast and and the pieces of Appalachian history that I myself had never learned of before I decided to take on this project. Um, And I know that I'm not alone in that. So many others who grew up here in this region had also not learned about these really fundamental pieces of our history as a people. And the thing is, as Kat points out, that defining Appalachia wasn't just something that happened in the past, but it's something that is happening. It is a verb in the present as well. It is an active erasure of our current 
working class folks and a leveraging of the story of our people only when it is suited to fit an agenda such as the agenda of the politicians who supposedly care about the working class coal families of Appalachia as a means of justifying their agenda in partnership with the coal companies when the rest of us are pushing for a just transition. And as Elizabeth outlines so eloquently in her book, the real forgotten working class citizens of Appalachia, just like in so many other areas of the nation, are the home health workers. They're the CNAs. They're the Dollar General workers, the McDonald's workers, the Bojangles workers. They are more likely to be women and they aren't offered the stability that comes with middle class employment. And this modern day narrative about Appalachia is something that I have already talked about on the show a bunch and about how the modern day narrative has been popularized over the course of a century and a half to paint our region as a space filled with, oh, and I said a century and a half. Honestly, it's been way longer than that. Um, But to paint our region as a space filled with contradictions of backwoods, uneducated people who supposedly don't know what's best for them. And we saw so much of this in the journalism that started springing up in 2016 around the the presidential election and referring to my region as Trump country. And this continues to show up today with folks who are seeking to explain why on earth Appalachia is the way that it is. And all of these like journalist pieces, all of these narratives around Trump country and the backwoods, uneducated people who just don't know what's in their best interest, all of this, these narratives are just leveraging flawed representations of Appalachia to paint a picture of this extreme version of some kind of, quote, other America, end quote, that is somehow deserving of condemnation. And I talk about this all the time, but this is a great resource to turn to this book if you want more concrete definitions as to how this manifests throughout history and more resources to turn to. And as Kat highlights from a quote by a historian, Ronald Eller, we know Appalachia exists because we need it to define what we are not. It is the other America because the very idea of Appalachia convinces us of the righteousness of our own lives. We've talked about on the show how this invention of the other has gone hand in hand throughout this country's history in order to protect, create, and maintain profit and wealth for the rich and powerful. And so this invention of the other has been related to Appalachia in so far that it has been about stealing a rich land full of resources from the poor people that inhabit it, starting with the indigenous people who were the original stewards of this land, which this has been a tale as old as time or at least as old as white supremacist capitalism. And this has been a process that has unfolded with intent and malice to justify the exploitative manifestations of capitalism that are that are necessary for profit, but to justify them so that they appear natural and necessary. Because capitalism always depends on losers. It depends on more of us losing than there are of us winning. And the people in power have to justify all of the people who are losing at their expense somehow. They have to make it seem righteous. And so Elizabeth basically says exactly what I've been trying to say in the podcast, but she just does it a little bit better. Using Appalachians to fill made-to-order constituencies that are anchored by race is a tired game. And 
typically a presence of social upheaval or social tension that challenges the status quo is often what triggers this larger cultural fascination with Appalachia. And it is almost always ultimately intended to pit Appalachians and other economically and socially disadvantaged groups against one another instead of connecting us around our shared struggles under white supremacist capitalism. We have talked about this over time, how the identity of poor white folks and poor working folks has been leveraged in order to keep them divided from folks of color by like having this ideal form of whiteness to strive to achieve under capitalism and also to be able to use poor white folks as like a scapegoat for a morally inferior form of whiteness. And it, it, it's so interesting how how many people will try to claim that Appalachia is this area that is the most dependent on government assistance, despite like people like people will say like, oh, more people in Appalachia depend on government assistance, even though they don't vote in favor of it. And folks say all the time to me, at least on social media, that Appalachia gets so much government aid and yet gives and supports that aid so little, which is part of what makes it easy for folks who identify as liberals to condemn and write off our region, right? That moral inferiority is rooted in this like perception of hypocrisy or whatever the fuck they think about us. And these narratives about this regional dependency on aid literally serve talking points on both sides of the political aisle. And we're going to come back to this, both sides benefiting from this narrative, but serving talking points on both sides of the aisle. And at the same time, they completely ignore the fact that corporate welfare runs Appalachia, allowing businesses to shirk their tax responsibilities, to hoard and destroy the land, and to wield enormous political influence while local communities suffer. I mean, hello, company towns. Hello, Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Schumer Mansion Bill. These narratives about our so-called dependency are a cover-up for the uneven distribution of wealth that haunts our entire nation, but which is made especially visible in Appalachia. And Elizabeth brings up this specific example of this conservative political commenter named Bill Crystal, who is known for shaming poor folks uh, using this dependency narrative, which we know is also rooted in racism and the Reagan era and the welfare queen narrative. And he earned his, he earned his PhD from Harvard in 1979, which, as Elizabeth explains, is the same year that Harvard University paid $2.82 in property taxes on 11,000 acres of land in Martin County, Kentucky. Now, I've never owned property, so uh, I, I, I wouldn't know how much property taxes one would assume to pay on 11,000 acres of land, but... I'm wondering, is it normally $2? Is that what y'all would guess it to be? And also, who if, if it's supposed to be more than $2, who's making up for the cost there, right? Because we all know that Harvard has also been in the pockets of big banks and these other big corporations, which students and alumni and others have been pushing them to divest from and have been partially successful in doing so. And I have brought up many other examples of elected officials in Appalachia who are also in the pockets of corporations who benefit off of our land and our labor and the extraction of those things, including Joe Manchin himself. And 
So Elizabeth goes on to bring up this event that I think probably at some point might even deserve its own episode. Um, And the event is the mine tragedy of Sago, West Virginia. That happened in 2006. And there are so many layers to this story, but I'm going to try and give the quick version here. So there was this blast and collapse in the Sago mine in West Virginia that trapped 13 miners in, in 2006. In 2005, the mine had been inspected as per usual by the Mine Safety and Health Administration, aka the MSHA, and was at that point cited 208 times in 2005 for violating regulations, which was more than or yeah more than double the amount that they had been cited for the year before in 2004 that year they had been cited for 68 violations so more than doubled and of the 208 violations in 2005 nearly half of those were considered significant or serious and substantial so on January 3rd, 2006, Bruce Watsman of the National Mining Association interviewed on Anderson Cooper 360 was asked whether any of the violations leapt out to him as endangering miners' lives. Watsman explained that it could just be paperwork errors or reporting errors There's a lot of violations, but, you know, there's not, they're not really significant to impact minor safety, were his words. So that was on January 3rd, 2006, that that interview took place. Around 6.30 a.m. on the morning of January 2nd, 2006, an explosion took place trapping those 13 miners. It was reported that the early hours after the blast were pretty chaotic and the mining company didn't call a specialized mine rescue crew until 8.04 a.m., more than 90 minutes after the blast. The company notified MSHA at 8.30 Although the company said it started its calls at 7.40, MSHA records two calls at 8.10 to personnel who were out of town and for holiday. And the MSHA personnel arrived on site at approximately 10.30 a.m. after like four hours since the explosion took place. The first rescue crew arrived about 10 minutes later. And high levels of carbon monoxide and methane gas in the mine atmosphere required them to wait 12 hours after the explosion to begin to search for the miners. So after those 12 hours, they started their searches and for a couple of days and thousands of feet, they searched until they saw the first hint of miners around 5 o'clock p.m. on January 3rd when it was reported that a body had been found. Because of the location of the body, those familiar with the miners and their jobs believed it was the fire boss, Terry Helms. Hours later, just before midnight, rumors spread quickly that 12 of the 13 miners had been found alive. 30 minutes later, The rescue team told company officials that the original report that 12 out of 13 miners were alive was incorrect. The early morning of, in the early morning of January 4th, 41 hours after the incident began, 12 of the miners were found dead. Randall L. McCoy Jr. was found alive, but in critical condition. And the remaining miners were found about two and a half miles from the mine entrance behind a rough barricade structure that was described by 
one of the rescuers. Ultimately, what ended up resulting from that situation was family and friends celebrated for hours over the announcement that 12 out of 13 minors had been found alive before they found out the truth about their own loved ones being deceased. The media coverage of the situation, according to Elizabeth, really normalized and naturalized many practices in our region that are not normal or natural. For example, mining coal is not natural. Despite the fact that it's a dominant industry, that doesn't make it normal or natural. Employees dying in the name of corporate profit is not normal and not natural. Recycling the raw grief of devastated families into a spiritual lesson, which was what largely happened in the pieces about these minors afterwards, about sacrifice is not natural. And then a month into his presidency, Donald Trump appointed the former owner of Sago Mine to be his secretary of commerce, which I'm honestly sure was actually a good choice because obviously the former owner, Wilbur Ross, fully prioritized profit as number one over the safety or well-being of people. And that's probably what somebody like Trump wants out of a secretary of commerce. And speaking of Trump, 2016 is such a pivotal moment in my own political evolution and radicalization. What I witnessed working in the presidential election of 2016 was the complete abandonment of my people and disdain towards my people in a way that was always present but was really so much louder. And it really brought this narrative surrounding my region and my people to a head. And it's so gross to me what happened. As I was literally working as in, as an organizer during the presidential election in my home part of this region, I was seeing what Elizabeth in the book describes as publications from my local paper to the New Yorker to Vanity Fair just flocking to the area to capture a glimpse of the people like some kind of freak show who they assumed stood ready to gamble our entire nation's political health on what would be a last ditch effort at self-preservation and a false hope because that's all we stand for out here to them. And I saw so many journalism pieces come out about my region that oddly enough never actually featured or talked to any of the people that I knew until way later or even people that sounded like I the people that I knew including my own rather conservative family members and I knew that if they had talked to these folks they would learn that it was so much deeper than this sense of self-preservation and false hope and I know that I've probably told this story a couple of times, but I'm like an old Appalachian grandma at this point. I'm just going to be repetitive and y'all are going to have to deal with it. But I remember working on the election campaign in 2016. And the reason that it was so radicalizing for me and pivotal for me is because I didn't apply to work in the presidential election for the Democratic Party. I was approached and called and hired explicitly because I or asked to apply because I had grown up in and was local to Appalachia and I had organized for like in my region on campus and beyond. And even though I had never applied for Hillary's campaign because I actually did not support her campaign and because I was seething after watching what happened to Bernie in the primaries that year while I was working on the election campaign in 2016, I fostered so many volunteer leaders and such a strong community around the campaign. And for those who aren't familiar, the way that organizing 
math works is that we break down the number of votes that we need in order to win the election in our specific area into shift goals based on the number of volunteer hours that we need to reach and talk to that many hours, uh, that many voters, excuse me. So if you have, you're going to need uh, 20 hours of volunteer time to talk to your voters. You break those into two hour shifts. You're going to need 10 volunteers to cover two hours each. So I had built all of this community and developed all of these volunteers, assuming that we were going to be talking to our neighbors about this election and trying to really counter organize the presence of the alt-right. And when early voting came, my shift goals were zero. Even though I was organizing three entire counties across this region, And I ended up being sent out of turf to suburban areas closer to the Piedmont. And what about my volunteers? When I confronted my leadership in the organizing campaign, I was told that Western North Carolina and these rural areas weren't actually worth our time. Even though... We knew that the conservative party and the alt-right were going to be organizing them. And if we're not providing a counter narrative to that, who do we think is going to win? So then after Trump's victory, we had all of these publications and all of these journalists completely flipping a switch to suddenly condemning and projecting this fantasy on Appalachia where we might be isolated and left to take the brunt of the consequences and reap what we had supposedly sown somehow. And for liberal political commentators, they conveniently did not have any analysis of the wealthy donors, the white suburban evangelical gentrifiers who were moving into Appalachia, or the insular Floridian retirees that were responsible for Trump's victory. Only us backwoods, uneducated, selfish hillbillies. We have no moral integrity as far as they were concerned. And what folks seem to forget is that Appalachia is actually not lacking in moral integrity. And in fact, this region has been deeply supportive of working class issues across generations and decades. And the way that this support support shows up in our electoral politics has definitely changed in recent years. I mean, we can look at how Obama won McDowell County in West Virginia by 8% in 2008 but then lost West Virginia as a whole in 2012, which is the example that Elizabeth gives us in her book. And even knowing that the support and electoral politics for working class issues has changed in recent years, that these changes have been brought about largely by the intentional sabotage and weakening of unions combined with the coal industries hostile and false narratives around environmental regulations. And in the same way that we were talking about earlier in this episode, but also in all of my previous episodes, the narrative is beneficial to both parties. There's this war on coal narrative, for example, that's been pushed by both the Democrats and the Republicans that basically just suggests that the decline of the coal industry is the product of overregulation rather than market forces, social preservation, ecological preservation, and competition for cheaper and more sustainable industry practices. And I often talk about on my TikTok in particular about the idea of political sports ball and how politics are perceived versus how they are actually played. 
And I think that this is actually really relevant to a lot of the points that Elizabeth brings up in this part of her book, where she's really talking about how Appalachia serves as a tool to provide these two political parties simultaneously a united message that pits workers against each other and against our environment that we depend on based on racial interests and identities and the capitalist agenda. But let me actually back up and like share with y'all what I have shared on TikTok in regards to political sports ball. So I like to refer to it as, or rather compare it to soccer because that's the only sport that I really understand and have played for any significant length of time. Although I did dabble in basketball and was just plain awful at it. So thanks for that dose of humble pie, Ma and Pa. But anyways, in this game of political sports ball, you've got your two teams and your goal on each side of the field. The teams are trying to score goals in order to rack up points and ultimately win the game. Pretty simple. And when it comes to political sports ball, points actually add up to power and wealth, which are racked up throughout the game. Now, most folks look at the game and see it as Team Red versus Team Blue, where Team Blue is trying to score points for the little guys, the working class and poor folks, black and indigenous and folks of color and women and LGBTQIA folks and so on and so forth. And meanwhile, most folks seem Team Red as trying to score points for the big guys. And this also depends on <clears throat> who you ask, honestly, since people really do perceive Team Red and Team Blue differently. But the big guys being the corporations, the bosses, etc. And most folks that it's think that it's Team Red politicians and Team Red voters versus Team Blue politicians and Team Blue voters. But the truth is that the teams are actually team rich and powerful, which is made up of the Democrats and the Republicans combined, and I'm about to share a little bit more on this, versus team the rest of us. And that's you and me and the the Burger King worker and the Walmart worker, the Amazon worker, etc. And the reason that I like to compare it to soccer in particular is because in soccer, each team has both an offense and a defense. And the roles of the players in offense and defense are very different. And they do require different skill sets, priorities, and strengths from the players. So this is where the two different political parties come in. Because the Republicans are actually playing the role of offense on team rich and powerful. And this means they are actively on the attack. They are really trying to steal the ball and score points to rack up the power and wealth for their team in particular. And they are not afraid to look aggressive in the process. And in fact, if they can come off as aggressive in their offensive strategy, that can even work to their advantage because if they're able to intimidate team the rest of us or use that aggression to frame our decision making so that we aren't playing with a clear mind, well, that's that's working in their favor. Meanwhile, the Democrats are actually playing the role of defense on team rich and powerful, which means that their job is to protect their goal from team the rest of us so that we don't score any points in their goal. And now this is the difference, right? Like Democrats are not actually actively trying to score goals on either side. Their whole objective is just to protect their goal so that the rest of us aren't scoring points against the rich and powerful. They are going to use a lot of different tactics, and they do use a lot of different tactics to protect their goal. Sometimes they overtly restrict our access to their goal by passing policies like NAFTA that create opportunities for rich and powerful to find cheaper labor overseas, 
which means that the team, the rest of us has to compete with the wages that they get overseas and they are actively undermining the wealth aspect of the goals that we're trying to score. Sometimes they protect their goal by using classic fake outs where they're like, pass the ball to us. They're making it look like they're doing one thing while they're doing another. We end up giving them the ball every eight years or so, and they just run down the clock while they also set up the play for their offensive team members to come back in and take over and score more points for their team when the time is right. And Roe versus Wade is a great, great example of that play. So anyways, with that in mind, it's relevant, this whole concept of political sports ball is relevant to this conversation that we're having about West Virginia and Appalachia being a representation of capitalist political ownership in such a visible manifestation and how the economic strategies in our region prioritize financial incentives and tax cuts that help larger corporations like Walmart and Amazon and stave off losses for company profits, for coal company profits, in order to create a united message around a narrative that the way forward for us as a country and as a society and as Appalachians requires unregulated capital in the hands of businesses rather than workers and communities. And it ultimately serves to pit workers against the environment in a battle for economic stability in the same way that workers have been pit against each other to uphold corporate interests throughout our nation's history over and over and over. It also reinforces this false narrative that unstable, low-wage employment is the natural replacement for permanent and benefited jobs under corporate growth, which I don't know, but to me, like I'm not an economist, but That sounds like an economic system that's failing if corporate growth equals worse conditions for the workers. But again, I didn't go to economic school, I guess. But it is 100% playing out in real time, even in my own community where I know I have mentioned on the podcast before, there's a literal Walmart that sits where the old Deco manufacturing plant used to sit. And the manufacturing plant offered stable salary jobs with benefits. And of course, Walmart doesn't offer those things, at least not for the vast majority of their workers. And so when folks talk about the voting habits of Appalachia, usually when they're talking about us and our voting habits, they're doing it with the intention of shaming and blaming us for the outcomes of our elections. We saw this in the recent rhetoric towards Kentucky after the flooding, We saw it even with the I literally posted informative videos on TikTok about the Mountain Valley pipeline. And like some people were literally nasty saying like we deserve the pipeline as if there aren't indigenous communities on the front lines fighting against that. Which, by the way, thank you and congratulations to the Power Coalition and their many member partner organizations to Grace Tuttle, who we've had on the podcast before. Please go check out that episode and the many other folks who are mentioned and credited in the episode notes for that episode. Uh, My ADHD is not going to let me recall all of the folks who have contributed to this fight. And there's no way that I possibly could because they're, they are innumerable. But um, if you haven't heard There was a recent victory in regards to Manchin's dirty deal that he was pushing through Congress. Please check out Power's website to read their statement on it and also subscribe to their newsletter if you haven't already. But that note aside, congratulations and thank y'all so much to all of the dedication and persistence and emotional and physical labor that has gone into this fight to make this victory possible. And I am so privileged and honored to have been a part of amplifying your work as a part of this journey and am just continuously excited to stand with you in solidarity in the many ways that we continue to move forward towards a just transition together. Um, 
but but that said, so when folks talk about the voting habits of Appalachia, they they do this while shaming and blaming us for the outcomes of elections, while one erasing our long history of support for working class issues and politicians, and two, completely disregarding the many, many factors that are currently at play in electoral outcomes. And I have seen firsthand in my own community how political candidates who are committed to the intersection of labor and environment and anti-capitalism or at least anti-corporatism and human sustainability, how these folks don't often fare well in Appalachia, but how it has absolutely nothing to do with their popularity among the people of Appalachia. Because when I talk to the people about the issues outside of an election or outside of a candidate-based context, we agree on practically everything. And instead of it having anything to do with how people feel about these issues or these candidates, that instead of it having anything to do with people being self-sabotaging or selfish or holding on to this false hope or whatever folks think it might be, it actually has so much more to do with access to the vote and with the fact that both political parties invest actively in the failure of those candidates. And... Elizabeth Catt in her book specifically offers up the case of Charlotte Pritt in 1996, which I think is a beautiful example of this. Charlotte Pritt, for those who aren't familiar, ran as a Democrat for governor in West Virginia on an anti-corporate interest platform. And in that election, she defeated Joe Manchin in the primary 39.5 to 32.6 percent. She was the first woman to secure the Western Virginia, sorry, the West Virginia gubernatorial nomination of either of the two major political parties and gained the endorsement of then President Bill Clinton. But for context, this was just after she had already held fast to her integrity around party politics and standing for her values because previously she had actually lost a 1992 bid for governor in the Democratic primary of that year. And following her loss, she refused to endorse her opponent and she mounted an independent write-in bid for governor in the general election. And so that action in 1992 had actually led to a splinter in the state's party establishment. So obviously these folks... Uh, the bitter folks on Team Rich and Powerful could absolutely not let this woman get away with winning after what she had done in 1992 to expose and thwart their power. So after the primary, a group known as, quote, Democrats for Underwood, which consisted of West Virginia Democrats who refused to back Charlotte in the general election, It also included members of the Democratic Party's elite. And there were folks like Joe Manchin himself who endorsed the Republican nominee over Pritt. It's almost like the Democrats would rather have a Republican win rather than someone from their own party who might pose a threat to the interests of Team Rich and Powerful. So here's just like a little teeny itty bitty baby piece of evidence that the Democratic Party isn't actually playing offense for us, but rather playing defense for that team. So anyway, she ended up facing all of these false advertisements and malicious narratives by both the Democrats and the Republicans. And still, somehow she only lost by a hair to the Republican candidate in the general election who won 51.6 to 45.8%. Is it any surprise to any of us that Charlotte went on to support Bernie in the 2016 primary and then went on to support Jill Stein in the general election of that same year? Absolutely not, or at least it's not a surprise to me. And I think that her success in West Virginia, despite being intentionally undermined by the well-funded interests of Team Rich and Powerful, speaks to the fact that poor working class folks of Appalachia are actually, in fact, sick of the rich and powerful using us to protect themselves. And we are genuinely interested in leadership who support us 
and who are authentic and who stand up for us. And while I don't think that any election or elected official will be the one to save us, and based on what I've read from Elizabeth Cat, this is purely speculation. I don't believe that she thinks that either. And I think that she makes really solid observations about why mountain folks tend to support more populist populist fringe candidates rather than partisan career politicians. Because we have seen firsthand in our region what happens at the hands of corporate politicians. We've had company towns. Our families have lost our homes. We've been murdered. We've been killed in coal mines. We've been shot dead in our homes for unionizing. We know what it means to suffer at the hands of the status quo, which very much so benefits white supremacist capitalism because that's the whole point of the status quo. And mountain folks, like while we don't have this, the words, right? Or the, the like analysis to always put on it, that really does influence the way that we view politics and the people in charge who are making decisions and who have that form of power. And I think that because we haven't offered this counter narrative with this more acute power analysis through the form of white supremacist capitalism, we've basically left this wide open field for alt-right white nationalist organizing groups to latch onto and build their own form of power by tapping into the the white fragility, honestly, that comes as a result of also like economic insecurity under this whole system and also being scapegoated by the people in power over and over. And so it's just this horrible recipe of like abandonment and scapegoating and trauma and economic insecurity and fight or flight and history and legacy and generations of racial pitting workers against each other and violence against workers for standing up and advocating for themselves and organizing for their best interests. And that there is so much that goes into Appalachia. And ultimately, I think this book, Elizabeth Cutt's whole point is just exactly that. I think it's that there's so much that goes into Appalachia. Our history is rich. It is so full. It is so full, so full of pain and so full of grief and so full of love and so full of tumultuous history that we are still fighting for today. Like we are still literally fighting for our history today. We do not, I, I like I started this, pop, this, this episode, I think this is a great full circle to bring us back to as we wrap it up. Like there's so much of our history that I never even learned in my education here in Appalachia. And I've heard similar sentiments from other folks. And why is that, right? Like who benefits from that? Why would our history not be shared with us? Who controls the history? Who controls the narrative? And when folks from outside of Appalachia, or even folks within Appalachia who are subject to this narrative that is not actually within our control, when we participate in the scapegoating and the prejudice and the shaming and the blaming and the division around Appalachian communities, who are we benefiting when we do that? And if our goal is a just transition or if our goal is collective liberation, is that the way? Is that what we're getting wrong about Appalachia? All right. And I think that's a great note to wrap us up. So thanks so much for tuning in for this week's episode, y'all. Don't forget that you can follow, support, share the podcast at our Ko-Fi page. You can also do so on social media and all of those links are available via our link tree, which will be posted in the episode notes along with all of the books and resources that I 
mentioned and or used in today's episode. And please don't forget that I do interview folks every other episode, which is every other week on this podcast. And I would love to use this platform to amplify the voices of Appalachians who are not traditionally lifted up in the professional culture of white supremacist capitalism. So if that is you, please reach out to me. Uh, you can you can reach out on social media, but you can also reach out on Gmail, which is rednextrising at gmail.com and is also linked via our link tree. Y'all are amazing. Love y'all so much. Please be safe. I know there's some storms coming through, at least in my neck of the woods this weekend. So y'all bunker down, buckle up, and Lord willing and the creek don't rise. We will see y'all again next week. <laughs>